Hi, is, uh, is Melody here, Melody Morrison? Uh, do you have the, the picture you could put up? Uh, before we get started, I just want to talk about uh, Micah, Micah John Massent. Uh, he was uh, Métis from the Red River First Nation and he was one of our chosen participants in the Indigenous Youth Internship Program that is led by and chosen by the First Nations Leadership Council, which is the BCAFN, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, First Nations Summit. He's originally from Manitoba. He was the youngest of, of five. Uh, he grew up in, in uh, Courtney, Comox Territory. And we're in our 12th year of the Indigenous Youth Internship Leadership Program that gave our First Nations and Indigenous youth uh, an opportunity to, to work in, in, in government. He um, went to Parks, BC, and he was on He was on that flight, the Ethiopian flight. And our, our, our prayers go out to his family. And to his community. I think um, oh, I, I'm, I'm a bit emotional right now. Is he was uh, so young. He went to Vancouver Island University, and um, and he was on his way to the uh, fourth United Nations meeting on uh, environment. And I, and I think it speaks to many of the practitioners in the room about what his vision was as an, an indigenous worldview. And uh, so our, our thoughts are, are with his family. So with that, I, I just would like for, for everybody to stand and have a, a moment of, of silence. Thank you. Deneza, Sekuza, Skyza, Masai Soda, see, Muskium Squamish, Sewatuts. Just want to acknowledge the, the territory around the Coast Salish people, the Muskium Squamish, Sewatuts, and also say thank you to the ceremonies this morning and, and getting us started in a, a, a good way. Uh, my name is uh, Terry TG. I am the Regional Chief of the British Columbia Assembly's First Nations and have been elected to this position since October uh, 2017. And really this initiative began before my time and there was a call to the Assembly of First Nations and the resolution is 60-2015, uh, support for a National Guardians program, uh, was moved by Chief Jean-Charles Piacho, Picacho, and Chief Tammy Cook-Searson from 
Black La Rage, uh, First Nation, Saskatchewan. So it has its, uh, it was born out of uh, back in 2015, but I think uh, with all the experiences of many of you that have been part of Guardians programs um, in years before, uh, there really need to be, uh, I think, a uh, place where we have a, a national organization that could uh, bring us together, learn from one another, but more importantly, to be re properly resourced. I recall back in the 1990s uh, in British Columbia, we had uh, well over 150, maybe 170 plus guardians, watchmen, not only on, on the land, but also in the seas of the, the, the coast Salish and the, and the north coast of, of British Columbia. Um, in, in my background, I, um, I'm a former uh, registered professional forester, so I'm a, I'm a recovering RPF, I always say. And, uh, but in that work uh, began uh, many years of, of working in the, in the forest and uh, in the forest industry. And, um, you know, really when I, I think about, um, I have a lot of notes here, but I'm, I'm gonna go off script because uh, quite frankly, you know, much of the work I do is born out of, of working in the trenches, of, of being uh, a person that worked in a technical aspect of what is going on in the bush, what is going on in our territory. I, I work for, for my community, Tackle Lake First Nation, and at the same time I work for the Cary Sakani Tribal Council, which was my community was part of. So very early on, uh, I worked uh, as in, in some capacity in, in research, and, and, and that's how I met uh, Valerie. Courtois, and, and we, uh, we did this project with Sustainable Forest Management Network to look at the indigenous worldview of a tenure, a forest tenure system. Uh, the experiences that we're, we're in, in the North Central Interior uh, had very many similarities to what was experienced in, in Newfoundland, Labrador. And uh, also the other aspect was, was it Quebec or, yeah, the, we chose three places and it was BC, Quebec, and Newfoundland, Labrador. But there were also differences as well because of the relationship with the provincial government. So at any rate, um, uh, you know, that was really, I think, the way I still see myself. It, it was those days I was a technical person when we're looking at a, a mine in my territory um, where the proposal was to dam up what was known as Duncan Lake to the, to the settler people. We call it Amazé Lake. Amazé, the, the, the mother caribou. To utilize that lake, dam it up and use it as a tailings pond. And then working on the, the pipeline issue uh, 14, 15 years ago, we had uh, six proposals, uh, one from Kinder Morgan, one from Enbridge, and four LNG uh, pipeline proposals. The original PTP, Pacific Trails Pipeline, was to import LNG from Kitimat to the interior of British Columbia and on to Alberta. That, uh, when the prices went up, reversed the course of that uh, pipeline. And now, there, when uh, everything settled, there's the, the proposal that we're seeing that many First Nations are supporting the coastal gas link, but it's still a controversial pipeline. We fought the Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline, which was two pipelines, a condensate pipeline going to the Alberta tar sands and uh, diluted bitumen going to uh, the coast. So in many respects, I, I think about all those days that, that still, uh, in many respects, continues on. But for me, it's a, in a different capacity. I'm, I'm more of the, that technical person background, but more of a voice, speaking to media, speaking to general public, speaking to neighboring First Nations about our worldview in regards to these many, many um, mega projects, if you will. And if you look at Canada, uh, we're uh, an extractive country. 
much of, of what is based on our economy has to deal with hydrocarbons, oil, gas, mining. Much of all the forests in, in, in all of Canada are, is being extracted as a commodity. And over the last few years, uh, with the, the, the issue of the mountain pine beetle, that was another initiative that I started out with uh, 14, 15 years ago, was the mountain pine beetle working group, and where we saw there was no voice for indigenous people. And there were plans out that the province was putting out. They had maybe one line, indigenous people will be affected. And that was it, something to that effect. And we said, no, that can't be it. We're the ones that are affected by, A, climate change, one of the biggest reasons why the mountain pine beetle break, outbreak happened. And B, we're, we're out in those lands and our people are still using those lands. We have to be a part of those plans. And so within the North Central Interior and the interior of British Columbia, 81, 85 chiefs came together and said, no, we're gonna develop our plan from our worldview. And that was born the, what followed up as a part of the BC uh, First Nations Mountain Pine Beetle Working Group was the First Nations Forestry Council, which still exists today and still advocates on behalf of all BC First Nations. And I gotta thank all our councils that are out there, BC First Nations Energy and Mining Council, which, you know, our fearless leader here, you know, heads that, and, and all the other councils that advocate on our behalf on many issues. So, um, I still see myself when I go to, whether it's the Prime Minister or the Premier, I understand the Premier will be here uh, later on, and, and talking about those issues. And, and matter of fact, um, when we were um, dealing with this mining issue in our territory that was called the uh, Chemist North that wanted to dam up this lake, the mining critic at that time was uh, our Premier, John Horgan. And, you know, so I've known him a long time. I remember those meetings in Prince George talking about what is going on in our worldview. We can't support this project the way it is. And, and really, we need our, our voices heard and our worldview uh, in terms of uh, development within our territory. So that really speaks to guardians, watchmen, and the work that you do because quite frankly, what you do is, is give voice to the land. It gives voice to our indigenous people and asserting our rights, our title, our treaty rights, and really putting, um, you know, much more than just talking about it. You know, you're walking the walk. You're out there looking at the land and understanding that, you know, this is, we need eyes on the land. And in my, my world previous to this, it was, you know, who's really asserting these laws? And why are we asserting settler laws? What about our laws? And it was the chiefs, and, I mean, the uh, compliance enforcement in, in, in British Columbia, the compliance enforcement officers, the, uh, you know, the conservation officers, but we need people out there as well to know and understand what is going on and, and to keep an eye on, on how development occurs, but also too, to, to really give voice to the land, as I was saying. So this is why this initiative is so important. And, uh, and we're glad to support this initiative in terms of, of getting a national voice and perhaps when we, when we start, really start developing this, in this initiative in terms of a national uh, guardians uh, program, that not only will it be supported, I know we've received about 25 million. I hope in the next budget that'll be much more similar to, to what the, the Australian government uh, you know, gives to, to, to the Aborigines in, in uh, Australia. Uh, well over 800 million or a billion dollars. I think that's what we need now more than ever in British Columbia, in Canada, because uh, we're really at a, a, a time in history 
where we're seeing many reports to talk about climate change. Over the last 30 years, we've seen 50% of all the carbon emitted in the history of the world has, has come in the last 30 years. And we have to deal with those detrimental effects of climate change. And that will be part of your job, perhaps, as guardians. And the first people to be affected by climate change in the world, around the world. I've been to these meetings. I've been to COP15, Copenhagen, and, and the Indigenous Caucus men. We've all been affected as first peoples to be affected, the, the detrimental effects of climate change. So that's another thing that, that's probably one of the most troubling things that we're going to be dealing with over the next 10 years. So my time's up. And I just want to thank you all for, for being here and, and really supporting this dialogue and, and supporting the, the initiative so we can uh, really keep uh, an eye on, on the land and, and give voice to the land. So, Masai, Masai Sodasni. Thank you. I just took one look at Leah and she went. <clears throat> Good morning. This computer's in my way here. Somebody can throw it out, out somewhere. Be good. good morning to you all. <clears throat> uh, as Leah had introduced me earlier, uh, my name is Dave Porter. And first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the people from Musqueam, the people from Slavitut, the people as well from Squamish for that incredible welcome this morning. And I also want to acknowledge Frank Brown, Kathy Brown and their family for the effort they put in to make this morning's ceremony so powerful. And, and Dave, I would like to as well acknowledge the power of your presentation. Um, every time you speak, I personally learn something and most importantly, feel something. And uh, we um, look forward to coming back to visit you uh, at Turtle Lodge. That's where he lives. And now that we got our medicine, we can pack up and go home now. <laughs> but Valerie insists that we do this work. So here goes. Welcome to the second annual Indigenous gathering. The first one was the one we held in uh, Ottawa. And Terry, I'd like to thank you uh, for agreeing to co-host this meeting here today and as well uh, your words of encouragement and as well your ongoing commitment uh, to supporting guardians not only here in British Columbia but at the national table of the AFN executive. And uh, we look forward to working with you, Terry, because there's a lot of work uh, that's going to uh, be done moving forward, and we um, appreciate uh, that support. And earlier this afternoon, you're going to hear about how did it happen, why it happened, and who is the ILI, uh, but I'll leave it up to those people that will speak to that. Uh, I intend to offer my views here today. And given I wor worked on this all night, I'm going to try to stick to the script. And it all begins with the fact that our people have occupied our lands for thousands and thousands of years. As a matter of fact, uh, as Frank Brown had stated, this morning, his people, the Heltsuk, 
I've been here for 14,000 years. And my friend Norma Cassie, who's here today, is part of the ILI group. Evidence at the Bluefish Caves in her traditional territory in the northern Yukon suggests they've been there for 27,000 years. And just this morning, when I woke up looking for Steve Killick's name, couldn't find it on my phone, so I punched in Alaska, then up popped the name, a story about a place called Delta Junction. And there, uh, just recently, they published the work that indicated the Alaska Dena have been there for 14,200 years. And so there is no question that we are a part of the land and a part of the water and have been so for thousands of years. And we are continuing to learn every day about that history uh, that has taken us through centuries. Am I sweating already? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> it's a history of strong and diverse indigenous nations and flourishing cultures from coast to coast to coast. Our songs, drums, our systems of governance, art and our languages have greatly enriched civilization and continue to do so. Where is the video? It was supposed to start uh, a couple of minutes ago. So if there's somebody that knows how to push a button, please do so. <clears throat> our people know the mountains, the plains, the sea, the great rivers, the valleys, and the trails that cover our homeland throughout North America. The land is our essence, and it looks after us. And in turn, it is our sacred duty, as our spiritual leader says this morning, to look after the land. You can keep the uh, audio down right till when I finish, then you can crank it. But in more recent times, this rich history, the very existence of our nations and our people was turned upside down. Our lands and our people were colonized. Successive colonial governments exploited our homelands for the resources they contained and followed genocidal policies that brought enormous human tragedy and even death to our people. This time, you, the guardians here in this room, will on our behalf and on behalf of our nations and your people to be the vanguard of the battles to be waged, combining traditional knowledge with modern science to find and implement solutions to the frightening realities of dying oceans, disappearing caribou, toxic landscapes, and polluted air. This place uh, is a place that's, uh, that you're looking at is a, a land occupied by our people and the, uh, uh, and the, the slavey people. Uh, Shuta Dena. That's Kaskala, my daughter Kili's name. Ptarmigan. I remember when my late Auntie Maida, when I was a boy, telling me stories of a time when our people could communicate with all, everything around them, the animals. And she talked about uh, when they went hunting, they'd seek advice from the ravens as to where to hunt. And Aunt Maida, passed away recently and she made the vest that I'm wearing. It's made for cold weather, so obviously I can't wear it here, but I did bring it with me. And um, I was hoping that she'd make a jacket, uh, but she told me, you're too big. I was <laughs> 350 pounds at that time. And she said, 
That'll be two moose hides. And, and moose hides are hard to get, she told me. And she also talked about how our people would follow the flight of the jeer and peregrine falcons. They knew as the caribou fed throughout the tundra, they'd flush the ptarmigans. And so the, this ancient partnership ensured that both the ptarmigan and our people would eat. And our people, as Dave demonstrates, are spiritual people who respect the natural world. We pray and express our gratitude to the sun for its life-giving energy. In our prayers, we thank the moon for bringing light to the darkest winter nights. The elimination of the moon's light would facilitate our people's ability to travel and to hunt the land. Our people gave thanks for the March winds whose warm breath would build a crust on top of the snow, allowing our hunters to stay on top as they track their game. The responsibility for maintaining and practicing these ancient traditions and knowledge has been passed to you, the guardians here today in this room. In less than 50 years, our elders went on a journey from snowshoes to satellites and witnessed change firsthand at warp speed. And they saw and witnessed with their own eyes the global march to self-destruction. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. And it's evident that the global governments who set those greenhouse gas emission targets in Paris will not meet those targets. And our appetite for burning fossil fuel continues unabated. And we must stop talking about transitioning to the green economy. We've just got to get on with it. And the transi transition process has to move from the crawl that it is that we're making to a full sprint. And you, the guardians here in this room today, must lead that race. We watch public governments continue to approve projects that they themselves know will destroy entire ecosystems. Those of us that were tuned in last week to the National, we watched the story in Pictou, Nova Scotia. And there, there's been this pulp bill after they swindled the land from the local indigenous people that has been spewing poisonous effluent for decades. And you could see it, this brown goop bubbling up in this water. And they allowed them to uh, discharge the effluent right into the nearby bay where the indigenous people fished for thousands and thousands of years, killed every fish uh, in, in the bay. And now their answer is to build some pipes and take the effluent further out to the ocean where people fish for lobster and other fish. And what really struck me is the incredible sense of entitlement that these people had the right to pollute and to destroy that environment. And they talked about how important the jobs were how many times have we been hearing that for the last few weeks? How important these jobs are. But do we have the right, just because for a job, that we can kill the environment, the oceans, the fish? And as well, what really has struck me is the veil threats that if the indigenous government and the public government shut down the plant over the next year, there could be violence. So that is a mindset, mindset that we have, to, we have to battle every day. 
And big oil continues to attack the environmental regulatory process, hoping for a watered down legal framework. We recognize and appreciate that not all resource sector representatives are looking for an SNC Lavalin style deal. The Mining Association of Canada has stepped up, adding a supportive voice to the establishment of guardians. And we welcome this support and we look forward to working with the Mining Association of Canada. We know that the Earth, our Earth, is the only planet in the galaxy that supports life. Elon Musk thinks otherwise, let him go to Mars, he can stay there for all I care. <laughs> and today, that life on Earth is very fragile, growing weaker by the day. And indigenous guardians must be our first line of defense against the destructive forces of climate change. We also need the help of our guardians in rebuilding our nations by increasing our capacity to govern and to manage the negative impacts of climate change. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recognizes our inherent right to manage our lands and resources and sets a standard of consent prior to any decisions being made on our lands and resources. We have over 40 guardian initiatives across this country. We need more. We believe every nation in Canada should have the resources to establish their own guardians programs. Our nations need the work of the guardians. Canada needs guardians. The world needs guardians. And as our friends, our indigenous cousins from Australia, who you'll meet later on today, they have a saying, the country needs people. And as our spiritual elder has said in the past, the earth wants to talk to us. We have to learn to listen because our survival depends on it. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak today and uh, we look forward to spending a productive two days further with you. So with that, sugasen la masi. No, don't crank up the volume. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to say that um, thank you, first of all, Terry and Dave, for your wonderful presentations just in consideration of our agenda. We won't be taking questions at this time, although if you see either one of these gents out by the coffee or on the breaks, they would be more than happy to have a chat with you. And at this time, I would like to ask Ginger, where's Ginger? Java, thank you for the gents. Where's the cameraman? This would be a really great photo op here. Ginger's going to come and say thank you. On behalf of the conference, we would just like to um, thank Regional Chief for joining us and sharing words, and certainly we'll keep Micah and his family in our prayers. We'd like to say thank you to our big brother Dave for uh, his wonderful presentation, even though the laptop was on his way. <laughs> so let's have a round of applause. Thank you.
And I would like to invite forward Ross Wilson, Jana Kotaska, and Elodie Button. And could I have another chair? We're gonna need another chair. You know, I'm pretty sure Oprah has way smoother transitions, so we need to... They're making Ross bring his own chair? Wow. That, my friends, is ind indigenous leadership, right there, right there. And because our time is so tight, if we don't have time for questions, the same, these three lovelies will be available to have a chat with you over coffee. Um, are we going on? Um, with us today, we have Ross Wilson, Stewardship Director, Metlakatla Stewardship Society. Am I saying Jana, right? Jana Kataska, Program Manager for the uh, Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative, and Elodie Button, Training Coordinator for the uh, Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. I ask Ross to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Val. Um, that's a tough act to follow with uh, Dave and Chief TG, so we'll do our best. Over the next few minutes, um, my colleagues and I are going to be giving you an idea of what, uh, at, a, at a ground level view of what we do with the Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative Guardian programs. Uh, before we enter into that, I would like to where are our friends from Australia? Yo, hey Stokwa. I also wanted to make a comment to ILI to welcome us all here. This is an incredible gathering. And uh, I think we're gonna make some movement here on the Guardian interest. This is awesome. Give me a few minutes, I gotta put my old man glasses on here. So uh, we'll be going over the brief history of the Coastal First Nations, uh, stewardship network, goals and structure, the programs, successes and challenges, and the benefits of guardians for the nations, the opportunities for Crown government, and recommendations for the initiatives. Nations of the Central Coast, North Coast, and Haida Gwaii organized into a Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative with a mandate to protect the environment, enable sustainable development, and enhance community well-being. It's a big task, but the leadership was committed to working together to achieve these goals. One of the object objectives was to address the lack of monitoring in our waterways. The Guardian Watchman program was established to monitor or patrol the territory, collect data, educate the public, and respond to emergencies. I'll come back to the last point later on in the presentation. All within the responsibilities of observe, record, and report. Who all does that? I want to see hands. Well, I'm looking at guardians here. Okay, hands on who all supports observe, record, and report. You support it? <laughs> we want authority. We want enforcement. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just had to take a look at that. As the Guardian Washington roles evolved, the leadership supported the development of a network that would span across communities and territories with a goal to identify and initiate training programs to support existing and new Guardian Watchman staff. I'm gonna have, we're, we're doing a tag team approach, so I'm gonna have Jana come up to do the next part of this presentation. Thank you, Ross. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Jana Kataska, and I've been working with the Coastal Stewardship Network for about 10 years now. So the goal of the network uh, is to strengthen the stewardship authority of and capacity of the member nations of the Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. And the way that it's structured is that each of the nations that belong to the Alliance have their own guardian or watchman or guardian watchman programs. They have different names. Um, and those are directed and funded by the nations. And then at the regional level, there's a nonprofit organization with a board of directors that is made up of the chiefs of all of the nations that belong to the Alliance. And we get our mandate and our direction, our broad direction from those chiefs. And then there's a stewardship directors committee, so the top sort of uh, stewardship advisor, head of the stewardship office in each of the nations comes together. We meet quarterly in person and then have monthly conference calls. And they work really closely with the network uh, staff to make sure that the programs are what they want and that they're being implemented the way they want. And so it's a big commitment from the stewardship directors you know, who leave their programs in their communities and their departments in their communities to work at the regional level. And it's a big commitment from the regional body to make sure that we're working really closely with the staff in the, in the nations. <clears throat> Uh, also, the funding for the two is separate, so the nations have their own funding and the regional level, we have our funding as well. And the funding comes from a variety of sources, each nation and the regional level, we reach out for different types of funding that can be own source revenue in some cases, it can be through agreements, government to government agreements or conservation agreements. Uh, there's also project funding that comes from government and we get a lot of, of our money too from foundations. So there's lots of different sources that people access for funding. And then we have a lot of different partners. So we partner with other nations in the region, other regional groups, uh, institutions like Vancouver Island University where we partner to deliver some, our training program. We partner with uh, different governments in the area, academia and uh, NGOs. So the team that we've uh, brought together to work at the regional level to support the directors and the, and the, and the communities in their programming uh, consists of a program manager, two regional monitoring system staff people, uh, two training coordinators, and communication support. And we can sort of divide the programming that the, that the nations are, are engaged in into sort of four different categories. And I'll go through these, I'll go through the first three, and then Elodie will talk about training, and then we'll turn it back to, to Ross after that. So the first category is uh, networking and collaboration. So one of the main reasons that the network was formed was to bring people together so that they can learn from each other, develop relationships, and, and develop best practices in how the work is done. So every year we have a, an annual gathering, and it's a highlight of the year for the nations and for us. And we bring everybody together, and at that gathering, people share what they are working on, uh, what they've worked on for the past year, what they're going to be working on for the new year. Uh, they, we bring elders to the gathering so that they can share their insight and their knowledge, and that there can be sort of both formal and informal uh, discussions with them, between them and the staff. Uh, and then there's also training at the gathering. So we, for last year, for example, we had the coastal, uh, Canadian Coast Guard come to do search and rescue training. And we had some people from the United States come to do some marine mammal disentanglement training, whale disentanglement training. And we always do an update on what's going on with our regional monitoring system as well. So we'll be having our 11th annual gathering this year, so that, we're looking forward to that in the summer. We also hold monthly conference calls for Coastal Guardian Watchmen so people can call in. And if they have some concerns about things that are going on, the, on, going on on the coast, then they can talk to each other about what's going on. For example, there was a concern with the way that seaweed was growing one year, and so people up and down the coast could talk about that. We brought on a, a sort of uh, acad a scientist who works on seaweed so they could ask questions and share both the indigenous knowledge on it and the scientific knowledge on it and sort of get a handle on what was going on. And we coordinate learning exchanges between nations. So if there's a program in one nation that another nation would like to develop, they can go to that nation and learn from them. This is a sort of catch-all of some of the things that we do to support Guardian Watchmen programs. So, uh, the staff are available for community visits, and those can focus on all sorts of different things. Um, sometimes staff will go up to a community and help with 
uh, planning the field season. So what is it that people want to monitor this year and what, how is that going to be timed over the year? We uh, go up and we work on safety programs, so making sure that, that the guardians go out and come home safely every day. Um, or if there's also can go up and, and show, work with the nations to show them the data that they've collected and figure out how that can be best used. We provide uniforms and flags and decals and brochures for nations to use when they're out on patrol to, to create that unified presence uh, and to have brochures to hand out to people that they encounter in the territory. We have brochures, sample brochures on the table over there in the corner if anybody wants to take one and take a look at it. Through our communications team, we uh, raise awareness about the programs and their roles. We develop at the regional level policies and procedures so that uh, nations have a standard sort of operating, a way that they operate. So right now we're working at, on the safety program, as I mentioned, so uh, nations are developing a comprehensive uh, occupational health and safety uh, program policies and procedures that they're using to uh, keep their guardians safe. And finally, we commission reports and studies to support the work of the nations, and I'll be talking about the business case at the end. Now I'll just talk about the regional monitoring system and then I'll hand it over to Elodie. So the regional monitoring system is a coordinated approach to collecting and using data that the nations have that asked to, uh, the, at the regional level for it to be developed. It's a set of standardized methods and protocols, uh, training and support through the, the two staff people, and a set of tools for data collection, storage, and access. So this is a little model of the uh, regional monitoring system. So it starts with the Coast Tracker app, uh, sorry, the Coast Tracker, which is uh, a custom built app that's on an Android tablet. And we did start with an off the shelf uh, app that we used, but encountered some limits with that, especially as uh, Guardians wanted to do more scientific data collection. And so we then developed uh, an app in house, uh, which also allows for quick changes as necessary, which is pretty important in the work that we're doing. So the Coast Tracker is then, the Guardians use the Coast Tracker to collect the data when they're out in the field. When they come back to the office, the data are uploaded to a central database, which is on a secure Canadian-based server that was really important to our nations that the data were in Canada uh, and secure. On that server, each nation's data is separate and is owned by the nation. So it is only through data sharing agreements either between the nations or with external parties, that those data are shared. So that has been a, um, it's been a long time in, in working together and developing trust to share those data and to use them at a regional scale. And then the nations can access their data uh, through the website, that we have a web portal, or they can use a GIS or they can just talk to our staff and ask for the data to be uh, sent to them, either raw data or in map products or whatever it is they're looking for. So here's an example of some data from the regional monitoring system. The one on your left, the sort of ready brown one, is some patrols for one, of, one season of one of our nations. So that shows all of the places that the guardians went. They turn their coast tracker on when they leave and it shows a track of all of the patrols that they did that season. So you can see it's a full coverage of the waterways in their territory there. So some of the regional monitoring successes. So there were over 900 patrols uh, logged to last year. So that just gives an example of how much coverage there is of the coast. And it, for me, it makes me feel very happy and safe and secure that people are out there looking after the coast. Uh, the data sharing agreements, as I mentioned, are a big success. So building that trust and, and sharing data to use uh, as at a regional level. And some of the examples of how data have been used, these are just a few. Uh, one of the really big successes of the nations through the regional monitoring system was uh, related to closing some crab areas. So they were very concerned about um, crab fishing in their, in their territories. And so they came together and they decided they would do both some scientific studies of the crab populations and monitoring of the traps in the area, the fishing, fishing pressure. Uh, and so they undertook this study and they needed to close some areas to fishing. DFO wasn't on side with that, so they did it under their own indigenous laws. They closed these areas to crab fishing uh, and they collected the data and were able to show how much impact there was on 
the crab populations, and then negotiating with DFO, they were able to have those areas also closed uh, under Crown law. So that was a big success for them. Also, as I sh the map showed, the data are really useful in demonstrating the role of coastal guardian watchmen. Also important in reporting out to communities. So nations, the guardian watchmen programs can show to their communities what they're doing and what they're seeing on the land. Or if they see something that they're uh, concerned about, they can take some data and photos and information, and bring it back to their nation and share it uh, with a lot of data so that they can figure out what to do about that. There's this big uh, body of baseline data that uh, nations have now so that over time they can look for trends or if so something were to happen on the coast, they can s sort of see from the data what the impacts have been. And finally, I'll just with one sweeping comment say that the, <laughs> the regional monitoring system is also being used both in uh, implementation of both land use plans and marine use plans on the coast. You can imagine that's a much bigger conversation. But. So now I will hand it over to Elodie. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really loud, I'm sorry. I have a very loud voice. Uh, I'd like to thank the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Slavetooth for having us here on your beautiful territories, and thanks to ILI for bringing us all together here today. Um, my name is Elodie Button. I'm one of the training coordinators uh, at the Coastal Stewardship Network, Coastal First Nations. Dana Holtby is my work twin. She's over there, and she's also amazing. Uh, we work together to coordinate a number of different training programs for the uh, guardians on the coast and the Coastal First Nations communities. And the one program that we're going to talk about today most, um, in the most focused way is the Stewardship Technicians Training Program. But I just want to say that this program has been in existence long before Dana and I came on board, and there are a number of people in the room here today who were part of the creation of this, and people who were um, like at home in their communities also, who were really involved in creating this program. And I just want to recognize them and, and, and re recognize all the work that was done um, prior to us coming on board and delivering this program. For the last three years, this program has really been um, our life. And we have given it our heart and soul, and so have the students that have participated in the program. It is a partnership. So the program started in 2018 as a pilot, and then ran again in 2013 as, a, as another pilot. And from the lessons learned, the evaluations, conversations, we built and adapted and evolved the program into what became a two-year program partnership with Vancouver Island University, who are also here today, so I'd just like to honor and recognize them as well for all the work that they do. Um, the program is a, it's a two-year program and it's cohort-based. So we have 16 students who come together from 10 different nations and they study together in two-week sessions. So a course is five days long, they'll have a day off and another five-day course. And they come together from September to March. We break for the field season and come back again together for the second year, September to March. The program travels, it's a community-based program, and it's generally held in three locations on the Central Coast, the North Coast, and Haida Gwaii, which are the three geographic areas that are represented by Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. So there are 14 courses in the Stewardship Technicians Training Program. There are five tickets or certificates that are obtained, and the courses are divided into sort of three categories, um, natural resource management skills, environmental monitoring skills, and leadership and career skills. The people who attend their program are uh, generally in the first couple of cohorts, they're people who are already working for their nations as guardian watchmen or fisheries technicians or land monitors. And then later in the sort of second and third cohorts, we had people who were not yet working for their communities but were interested in um, obtaining work as guardian watchmen or monitors uh, within in their communities. At the end of all the courses, we have an evaluation and we have an evaluation at the end of the year. And this program is actually going to be wrapping up um, in April of 2019, and we're going to be doing like a big comprehensive evaluation to really um, tease out all of the lessons learned and the best practices. That said, we have a few things that we have learned that we'll sort of humbly offer um, for those of you who are considering training programs, considering creating programs, or, or wanting to know um, some of the things that we have learned. There's a lot of things that we have learned. As I mentioned, this program was really our life. Uh, for, for years, um, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that. But I'll start by saying that having elders and knowledge keepers in the classroom, obviously, it's key to student success. It's also, it's not only about 
creating an environment in which people are able to learn culture and technical skills. It's also about creating an environment in which people feel safe to show up as their full selves. Uh, time and time again, we have seen that students are more engaged in hands-on, experiential, field-based learning. Not all of the courses are going to be experiential. Sometimes you are going to be focused on note-taking or a particular leadership skill that's going to be classroom-based. But the more time you spend outside, the more engaged students are and the more they want to come back, even if you're doing water monitoring in the winter when the water's frozen, <laughs> which has happened to us. Um, the other really important part of this program is the role of the VIU coordinator and the community coordinators. So the VIU coordinator, the Vancouver Island University coordinator, helps students with a whole bunch of different academic questions. So their transcripts, um, registration, whether they're interested in pursuing further post-secondary education. And that role is really important. The other really important role is the role of the community coordinator, and that's the role that Dana and I have. We are in the classroom every single day for the two years with the students. The instructors come and go, but we are the thread that ties all of the courses together, and we're often not only the person who's making coffee and setting up the classroom, but also mentors, tutors, sometimes we're community liaison and counselors, sometimes we're just supporting peer supports. Sometimes we're co-teaching with the instructor. Um, and having that person who is supporting the students all the way through is a really, really vital part of this program. That community coordinator creates a container within which people come to learn. And the major philosophy of the program that we have created is that we're focused on group success rather than individual achievement. That means that we're coming together and learning as a family, and sometimes you're gonna be a total beginner in one of the courses. For, for example, um, you could have someone who's uh, working as a fisheries guardian in their community, and they're taking an archeology span course, but there's someone else in the course who works as a land monitor, and they have a ton of experience on the land in that way, and so they get to be a leader, they get to sort of co-teach with the instructor, and the person who's like the fisheries guardian gets to be a beginner, a new learner in that context. But then, three months later, it might switch, and the course will be on fish monitoring, and that person will get to be a leader in that course, and then someone else will be a beginner, and, the focus on group learning and group success is really what um, I think has contributed to the very high retention rate that we have and the very high success rate. We are building relationships between nations up and down the coast through this program. And the other really important part of this program is that it's really important to meet people, to meet students where, they're, where they find themselves, where they're at. Trauma and addiction and mental health, community and family realities, literacy challenges, numeracy challenges, computer skills challenges, all of those things are present in the classroom. People come to a training program, a technical skills training program, as their whole selves. And they bring all of that with them. And an effective training program is going to create space for people to be their whole selves and navigate what they're navigating while learning. And I think that part is really important. So, while we're talking about a technical training program, a stewardship technician's training program, we're talking about a lot more, actually. And so I'll just share briefly some of the successes that we've had in this program. We have seen a student who came into the program having never taken any post-secondary education, come in really keen, straight A student, helping other students to you know, be successful in the program go home to their community and be employed for the first time as a guardian, and then the next field season get promoted to a coordinator in their community. We have seen so many students come to the program very, very shy, really reluctant and uncomfortable to make a presentation, and with the support of this family community that's created, by the end of the two years, they're able to stand in front of a group of 30 people and do a presentation about themselves and their work as guardians. We have seen um, people learn to connect to their culture, uh, be inspired to dig deeper into their art and language as a result of having knowledge keepers and elders present in the classroom. We've had students who are personally struggling in really dark times make it through those times as a result of this family and community that has been created. And we have students who have 
developed a relationship to their land and their territory that they didn't have before. People who have said, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize how vast our territory is and how many stories there are until I started this program and went home and was working in my community, had the opportunity to really be on the land and to be learning from those who know. The truth is that um, every story, every student has a story to tell in this program. And um, I just want to take a minute to honor three of them who are here in the room. Um, if you would just stand up for one moment. If you have some questions about um, the program, there are three students who are participating in the pilot and the cohort two and three. If you'd like to know more, you're welcome to ask them more questions at the break. Um, every student has a story in this program. And Many of them are stories of transformation. Uh, this is a, a, a summative evaluation that we did of the, some of the things that people had learned in the program. And you'll notice that um, some of it is focused on technical field skills, water monitoring skills. Um, there's just so much. But a, a lot of it is, is interpersonal. It's about like learning together. It's about love and, and pride and resilience. And um, it's hard to really capture that in a short presentation, but I hope you'll just trust my heart. <laughs> um, we are moving forward as the Stewardship Technicians training program comes to an end. There are a number of other training priorities that we are going to be working on as a team, uh, and the stewardship directors from each community will help us determine what those priorities are. They may include safety programs, indigenous governance programs, forestry monitoring, archaeology and cultural heritage work, emergency response work, compliance and enforcement skills, and we'll be working as well to support uh, coordinators, managers, and directors with management skills training and um, a leadership training as well. Uh, eventually, we will run a program similar to the Stewardship Technicians Training Program again, but we're going to take a minute to evaluate and assess and, um, and you know, determine what our priorities are for moving forward. Thank you. So I just have a couple of more slides and then I'll turn it back to Ross to close up. Uh, so some, just to sum up some of the successes at the network level. Uh, so I already spoke about the strong presence um, of the Guardian Watchmen uh, across the territories. So that, that visibility, that recognition by the public and by resource users. And a really strong identification and pride with that role of being a Coastal Guardian Watchman. There's been strong protection of ecological and cultural sites and values. Stronger relationships built between uh, nations. So you'll often hear people talking about the time before the network and when they didn't know people in the next nation and what they were doing or who they were. And now there's, it's like a family and people come together and they're really excited to see each other and they know what each other's doing uh, nation to nation and they work together on those things. The peer-to-peer -peer learning and the development of best practices has been really important so that a nation, you know, nations are leading in different ways and so those that are leading in one area bring the others up in that, that way and then in another, another nation will be leading in another way area and bring nations up that way. The, there's been increased capacity, so there's more programs on the coast, there's more staff within each of those programs, there's more, and those staff are more skilled. And it's created a whole new career path. So as Elodie mentioned in the talking about the training programs, there are young people now who are wanting to do this and moving into this as a career. And so they're taking the training and then develop, becoming guardian watchmen and then moving up into leadership positions as well. And the individuals are changed. Again, Elodie was you know, talking about how, how impactful the program, the training program has been on, on people. And finally, there's this, the data, the data that nations have collected and have there to use uh, in decision making and in negotiations. There are, there are no other people out there collecting this kind of data. Most of the government decisions are made on modeling and it's not on field data. And yet the nations are going out and they have this data to use. So there's a lot of successes there. There's also challenges. Um, it's an extremely dynamic environment that we work in and that the nations work in. The communities are changing, their capacity is changing, their members' priorities are changing. 
Uh, there's different opportunities and threats that come up on the coast all the time. Technology is changing, funding opportunities change, government mandates change. So it's a very, very changing environment and the key to survival is really flexibility and ad adaptation um, at, the, at the regional level and making sure that we can respond to the needs and the changing environment. Distance is another really big challenge. The nations are spread out far uh, along the coast, they're remote, there's not a lot of transportation. And so one of our biggest costs really is travel. Getting people together costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. And finally, funding. Uh, when funding is piecemeal and project-based and has heavy reporting requirements, you can't do this kind of work, the nations can't do this kind of work that they're doing. It, it requires sort of long-term funding that can be flexible so that, that that time and effort can be put in, people and skills can be built up, programs, systems, and have that robustness. So I'll just finish and then I'll pass it to Ross. So I was talking about the business case that we did. So a couple of years ago, the stewardship directors wanted to undertake a business case to see what the value of Coastal Guardian Watchman programs um, are to their communities. And so we hired EcoPlan International and undertook this valuation. And they've worked with the communities, uh, with the stewardship directors and stewardship staff to find out what all of the different benefits of the programs are. And I know you can't read those little white words on the rippling out circle, but those are all of the benefits that were identified. And that circle is bigger. This is just a portion of it. It's the full circle of benefits. So there's a lot of benefits up there and I, I welcome you to take a look. In your packages, the link to this, um, this study is, is there and there's a lot of benefits there. They were grouped into these categories so you can see the categories on the side. Ross will talk a bit more about those benefits. But overall, they found that there was a ten, over a 10 to 1 return on investment. So for every dollar a community puts into their, coastal, their Guardian Watchman program, they get a tenfold return. And that's on the low side. Some of the communities had a 20 to 1 uh, return on investment for the, these programs. So they have a lot of impacts on communities. Thank you. How much time do I have? Oh, come on. Um, so I wanted to make some references to um, some of the presentations that uh, Elodie and Jenna did, and it's more in around um, sweat equity. Uh, whether it was at a community level, a program level, or a leadership level, there was a lot of work put in that isn't recognized to create the need for a guardian program in the communities, a, a network, and move for, more toward a regional support system that was just described. And that needs to be recognized. So when you go back and look to do this in your community, sweat equity plays a huge role. And you just have to get down and do it, because that's what we did. Um, so as we look at the business case, we, um, it, it, to us it's a very valuable tool. It allows us to dig, dig deeper into the details of a guardian watchman position and at the same time provide an interesting insight into how the guardian watchman is reflected in our communities. It's established in taking care of our territory. I'm going to come back to that. Gave us the determination to achieve governance authority, support our community well-being, add to our cultural well-being, provided support for the nations within new economic opportunities, created a financial inflow model. Now, what does that mean? Well, the fact is that when a guardian gets a paycheck, the money turns over in the communities. We don't recognize that enough. A lot of our communities are isolated. There's not a lot of work. There's high unemployment of 80%. So when you receive a paycheck that turns over three, four times in your community, your community benefits. So the value of creating a guardian program, which evolves into a network of over, the number I saw was over 600 bands in, BC, in Canada. Can you imagine the effect that would have in the communities? So, uh, and the term they use is the velocity of money. That's important to us. 
we have to continue to support that strategy. I want to take uh, revert back to the taking care of territory and, and our brothers and sisters from Australia gave us that. They have taken care of country, or is it in country? Tell me what it is. On country. On country. That little term really made us reflect. There's a number of us that went to Australia to experience what the Rangers were doing and look into how they've established their programs and training and the network itself. Is there over 300 communities that are Yeah, it's huge. And you heard Chief TG talk about how much money was available to them. Just, this is just in Northern Australia. It's not into the Central and South Australia. So the, the experiences we learned in Australia made us come back with a really revigorated effort to say, how do we do this? And what are the steps to do to make sure that we can do it? And the other reference I want to make to the Australian uh, work was the Coast Tracker. In Australia, it's called Eye Tracker or an Indigenous Tracker. We don't put enough effort into looking at the value of that tool. It is a standard of collecting data that will not be approached by any levels of government or courts. So if you're going to collect data on an incident, it's recorded in that, that tool that both the federal and provincial government have better recognized because it's their standard. We put our swag equity to, to make sure that that tool was meeting our needs, was so that we can move toward the enforcement, compliance. Okay, if I go to court, my tool is going to support me. So we, we need to also look at whether this is something that the network would want to engage in because that tool to us is, is very valuable. And um, as we evolved through the, the, the programs and into the networks, we were always, um, we began to start using the 10 principles and the UN Declaration. It was something that is our common language now. We want to make sure that both the federal and provincial government adhere to their commitment to it. And it's something we do on, on, on the ground level, so it's important to us. The critical program, uh, Guardian Washington is a critical program for our nation. It builds a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. You saw the big, uh, uh, the student body that was there. They're from five, six different communities. Uh, the Guardian Washington program supports our communities. It contributes to ecological and social benefits. It establishes a, out in our territory, which is critical. It makes resource users aware of we are watching them provides more data on activities and infractions, and more efficient and effective dollars, that velocity of money. In uh, the evolution of 10 plus years, we've had a number of funders that have really supported us in various uh, degrees. We have the Gordon and Betty Moore, Wilberforce, Tides Canada, Ministry of Advanced Education, Skills and Training, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and the Tula Foundation. And to be honest with you, the, the main uh, support we got to go after that funding came from the Coastal First Nations Great Bear Initiative. That was the political body that allowed us to kick in those doors to say, you need to support us to fund our program. I don't think I have time for questions, but I, I do have, um, there, there's a, page up there that I, that I have, and I'm not going to read into it, only the, to the point that we would be happy to get in, engage in a roundtable for these potential topics. But my last comment in regards to the value of the guardians, where are you guardians? Stand up, please. Stand up, guardians. <clears throat> Stay, stay standing, please. Stay standing. 
the value of these people out on the water, out on the land, can't be measured. I'll give you a couple of examples. The Queen of the North sank just around the corner of Kitkat territory. The first people on, on site, guardians and community members. They saved all, majority of those people, except exception of two, because this was their core to help. If we look at the incident of Nathan E. Stewart, the Guardians played a big role in monitoring the incident and assessing the damage that that sinking did to their territory. My last comment to you Guardians, specifically to you, leadership take aware, your ancestors are proud of what you do. That's in you. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us present. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. And you were a little bit ahead of schedule, so we got time for one. If we have one burning question. But if you don't, I mean, you just get to go early for lunch, so you're standing between, no, I'm just kidding. If I could ask um, Ginger, do we have? Okay. I think nobody wants to stand between us and lunch, but these three fine people will be around for you to stop and have a conversation with. And if you recognize anybody who stood up as a guardian, I think it'd be great to stay, to stop and talk, speak with them as well for any questions. Thank you. And we, as a, we would like to thank you once again for the wonderful presentation that you gave and the such incredible work that you're doing there. We're very happy to have you with us. No, Ross, you can leave the chair here. Just kidding. Okay, You're, please note that we're ahead of schedule. We're breaking for lunch. You have to be here exactly at one o'clock because this afternoon is gonna be really tight. One o'clock, see you here, thank you.